Uh, God, thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And Father, as we are entering into your word today, I pray, God, that, that we have an encounter with you, that we encounter you in our minds and in our hearts, that we leave this place encouraged but also challenged. So, Father, please guide us to the truth today. In your name we pray. Amen. So recently, I was at one of my son's basketball games, uh, Jalen, and the game was intense. People were cheering, people were screaming, and I said it before, whenever someone hits a three-pointer, the crowd, you know, a crowd of parents are supposed to go, boom! So that's what we're supposed to say, Okay? Everyone does it, and it's like, it pumps you up. And then when you ever hear the other crowd doing it, it, it makes you mad. So, now, if, if you know, usually the seating arrangements are, there are bleachers on one side, and then you have one set of parents on one side. So, let's say Jalen's team, all the parents are sitting on one side, and then on the other side of the bleachers are the other parents, okay? So, we're practically kind of sitting next to each other. Not like totally sitting, but you can see them. So we're all cheering, we're all screaming, you know, boom, boom, everything going like that. And I suddenly glance over, you know, to the opposing side, the other parents. And I noticed one of the parents was making faces at me. I kid you not. So I would go, boom! I'd look over and he'd go, eh! like, I'm, I'm not kidding. He'd make me, eh, 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 like, something like that. A grown adult, a grown man, acting like that? So I start immediately having bad thoughts. And I'm like getting amped up because every time he cheered, he'd go, uh, uh, like he'd make all these faces. So I'm looking at him and I'm like, man, you know what would be fun to do? Punch him in the face. <laughs> oh, that's so dark. But I was like, man, he has one of those faces that are punchable. You know those punchable faces? So I'm like, I'm like, Think, I'm not even watching the game anymore, and I'm thinking about daydreaming of what it would be like if he goes glib to me, and I just punch him in the face. So I was getting amped, getting amped up. So I'm like thinking all these like bad thoughts of what I'm going to do to this guy, when suddenly someone, a parent, comes up to me and he's like, you're, you're a pastor, right? I was like, what? I looked up, it's one of the parents, and this was a time when all of the parents started finding out that I'm a pastor and stuff. So like they're all like asking questions. But for some reason, him saying that like snap, like it snapped me out of my like devilish rage. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, oh, that's right. I am a pastor. I, I, I am a Christian. I just can't go around punching people. I have to do the right thing. And I was like, man, that's, it's so weird. It snapped me out of it. You know, when I, when I look at everyone, everyone has a reason. Everyone has a motivation for what they think is right. Everyone has a reason for what they think is doing the right thing. You know, you talk to people, some people do the right thing for practical reasons. Like if... You want to make friends. It's probably best to be kind. It's probably best to be nice. For other people, there's like this social pressure to do the right thing because people want to be liked. They want people to like us. And those, those are good motivations. But these motivations aren't always foolproof because sometimes social pressure encourages people to be mean. Sometimes it feels good to do the wrong thing, like get revenge. Like if I punched that guy, I probably would have felt good for the moment. 
And they're probably real, oh gosh, I'm a pastor, can you imagine what people would say? But sometimes it feels good to do the wrong thing. So we need a better moral compass. A better moral compass that, are not, that is not necessarily based on our feelings. Because our feelings change. They change quite often. We need something consistent. So that's my big question today is, where do Christians get their moral compass from? And that's what our Bible story teaches us today, that our moral compass comes from being consistently aware of God's coming judgment. And I know, some people are uncomfortable when I said the word judgment. They're like, oh, why? I know if you remember our Revelation series, we went in depth and we talked about judgment. Um, if you ever want to check that sermon out, it's on YouTube, so please check it out. We talk about why God judges. It's on YouTube. But remembering coming judgment, that we are accountable to God, it helps us commit to fairness and generosity. And that's what we learned from our Bible passage today. So if you want to read with me, let's read it. Job chapter 31, verse 13 to 23. Ten verses. Here we find Job explaining why he's committed to, do, to doing the right thing. So if you want to open your Bibles, if you do not have your Bibles, it'll be up on the screen. Okay, so Job chapter 31, verse 13 to 23. Verse 13, it says this. If I have denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? If I had denied the desires of the poor, or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless. But from my youth I reared them as a father would, and from my birth I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing or the needy without garments and their hearts did not bless me for warming them with the fleece from my sheep. If I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from the shoulder. Let it be broken off at the joint. For I dreaded destruction from God and for the fear of his splendor, I could not do such things. So based on our passage, our first point today is the knowledge. The knowledge, the awareness of God's final judgment leads us, leads me to fairness. In high school, I was at a Burger King, and that's the old school logo, and I ordered a Whopper. A Whopper meal. So it comes with fries and a drink, obviously. So I ordered it from this cashier. But the cashier gave me the wrong change. She, I don't know, maybe she's dumb or something. I don't know, but maybe she just didn't know math or what. But she gave me the wrong change. She gave me more than she should have. And I was like, yes. My first reaction was like, oh my gosh, yes. You know, I could use this money for KFC Tutti Tuesday and have that for dinner. I'd have extra money. So I wanted to take the money and walk away, walk with my Whopper. But then I felt convicted. Ah, oh, gosh. You know, I felt like, oh, someone was like, you know, pushing me. It's like, oh, maybe you shouldn't do that. So I was like convicted to tell her the truth that she made a mistake. So I got up from my seat and said, oh, yo, you gave me the wrong change. And she told me, oh, my gosh, she was so happy. You know, I was like, oh, my gosh, maybe we could fall in love or something. But it was like, it was crazy that she was so thankful. She was saying, oh, gosh, no one's ever done this. You probably should have taken it. But I walked away, I'm like, oh, it sucks. 
I could have had free Tutti Tuesday. Is it still Tutti Tuesday on KFC? No, it's not. But it used to be. It was amazing. But I was like, man. So I walked away. I'm like, ugh. Like, mad about it. But I guess I did the right thing. I always feel like God is watching me. I always feel that way. And, that, and shouldn't that be the case? I mean, he's real, right? He's real. Should I not treat him that way? That God watches everything. He's real, so he shouldn't be able to watch everything that I do. But I would argue that many Christians don't live like God is real. They believe it. Oh, they believe it. They'll say it. They'll be quick to tell people, I believe God is real. I believe God exists. But we don't live that way. We don't live like he's watching us or we're accountable to him. But here we see Job's mindset. Job's mindset was always, God is watching me. I'm accountable to him. Everything I do, I'm accountable to God. Let's read what he says in the first couple of verses or passage that I just read. Verse 13 and 14. He says this, If I have denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? These are great questions. So we, we find out that Job feared. He feared the day that God would confront him. He feared the day that God would call him to account for all the things he did wrong. And that's why he's so careful. Look at all these like examples, okay? He's so careful to treat his servants fairly. And if you read the verses... Leading up to our passage, we find out his fear of God went to other things. He feared God so much that it also made him faithful to his wife. The other verses preceding this, it made his fear of God made him honest with everyone. And it's the same for us that we too are supposed to fear God like Job did. And I know some people are uncomfortable with that. I know some people are uncomfortable with fear being a motivator. But I think I argued in other previous sermons that I think fear can be a good thing. It can be a good thing. Fear can keep us out of trouble. For example, we wear our seatbelts because we fear the consequences of not wearing one because you might crash. Fear could be, or the wisest thing to do, we could die. So I put my seatbelt on. We don't drink and drive because we fear, oh my gosh, I could kill someone. I don't cheat on my wife, not that I would, but it's just an example. I don't cheat on my wife because I fear what it would do to her. In our marriage, I fear what it would do to my kids. Because I've met people. I've seen how infidelity destroys their family. So I fear that. So to me, this is a, a healthy fear. A good fear to have. This is the type of fear we should have with God. That we should always be aware that evil has consequences. And with the judgment of God, God wants to get rid of evil. He wants to get rid of evil. But God doesn't only judge us for evil, but he also judges us for the good that we do. That the knowledge of God's judgment will always lead us to a path of hope. It will always lead to a path of wisdom. It will always lead us to a path of joy. 
This was Paul's attitude later on in the Bible. If you look at 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 5, verse 9 to 10, he says, so we make it, we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. That Paul knew if he pleases God by doing what is good, God would someday give him what is due. But if Paul did what was evil, God would also judge that too. So in the end, God will be fair. Good will always win in the end, but evil will always lead to regret. And when we remember that, when we remember that, we will always be fair to the people around us, just as Job was fair. But it's not just about fairness. And that leads to my next point. The knowledge of God's final judgment leads us to charity. It leads us to charity. My, uh, my children love this guy named Jimmy. Jimmy Donaldson. But his, I guess his real cool name, well, it's not I guess his cool name is Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast! Well, that's cool. I would love to have that name. But I do not. But my kids love him. We'd watch, I'd watch videos with them, and I'm like, my gosh, this guy is so entertaining. Like the things that he does, all the stunts and stuff. It's like so extravagant. Um, I used to love uh, Squid Game. I don't know if anyone's, but he recreated it. And the, the winner got $456,000. I'm like, wow, this guy, this guy is crazy. Recently, he's been doing more videos focused on charitable endeavors where he literally gives away millions of dollars. I was watching a video. He gave a homeless man $10,000. I was like, wow, we're Mr. Beast. And then he paid for cataract surgery for 1,000 blind people. I'm just like, dude, who is this guy? There's another video called Rebuilding Homes for Tornado Survivors. Donald said Mr. Beast built 14 homes in Kentucky for those affected by the tornado. There's another video titled, I gave away 2,000, I mean 2,000, 2 million, yeah, that sounds weird, 2.7 million, I'm going to say it that way, 2.7 million of dollars of free clothes. And it details his partnership with, with Champion, you know, they're giving all these um, clothing to the um, Hopi, I think Hopi, Hopi Indian Reservation in Arizona. Then he builds wells in Africa. Like, man, this guy's crazy. I'm just like, wow. You know, at first when we were watching those videos, it was entertainment. Oh my gosh, we're going to drop this thing on a Lamborghini. Or what is that other one where they were shooting guns at some car and they had to pretend. It was like crazy. But his charitable endeavors were nuts. It was pretty impressive. We were doing some research on it that Mr. Beast can generate these extravagant and expensive projects because his videos get so many views that it creates a lot of ad revenue. So there's a business behind this. But when we look at his business model, it's interesting. In a YouTube video, now if you ever want to check my notes, I have all like the citations and stuff, so I'm just, you know, you could fact check me if you want. But in a YouTube video, he explained that he invests everything back in his videos. If he has a million dollars in his company's bank account, he will spend a million dollars on the next video. If he has $5 million available, he will spend $5 million of that on the next video. And he says, he's constantly stressed about the possibility of running out of money. It makes sense. Most people wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. No thanks. I don't think I could. Because it's pretty risky. But I think we could argue, or I'm going to argue, it's a very Christian way of thinking. It's a very Christian way of thinking to invest everything we have for others. 
to not just stop at fairness, but to move on to generosity, to have this mindset. We see this with Job as well. Like if we read verse 15, 16 to 23 again, let's read it again. He says, if I have denied the desires of the poor or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I've kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, but from my youth I reared them as a father would. And from my birth I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perishing for the lack of clothing or the needy without garments, and the hearts did not bless me, for warming them to sleep with from the fleece from my sheep. If I raise my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from the shoulder. Let it be broken off at the joint, for I dreaded destruction for God, and for fear of his splendor, I could not do such things. So Job's mindset is he felt that he was given riches, influence, power as a gift. But he was accountable to God with what he did with it. If Job had not been charitable, he has all this money. If he had not been charitable, that would have been a sin. If he had not addressed a need, especially when he had the power, especially when he had the influence to do something about it, then Job's mindset would be it would have broken his relationship with God. We're meant to learn from this, this attitude, this mindset. Let's look around. There's so much poverty. There's so much poverty in the world. Just turn on the TV and go on social media. It's not, not very hard. There's so much poverty in this world. There's material poverty. But then there's also social poverty. There's also spiritual poverty. But it is the norm. It is the norm for North American Christians like myself to hoard, to hoard that money or that influence, that power for ourselves, for myself. We have been convinced. We have convinced that we've earned everything that we have. It's mine. And we cling to it. We cling to it with closed fists. We, we are just stingy about it. But the mark, the mark, of someone who really fears God. It's someone that says, God gave me this gift. God gave me this gift of success, of riches. God gave me this gift of influence. And I need to use it. I need to use it to help and bless others. Not just use it for myself. I need to use it to help and bless others. So we need to find people, find people, emulate them who do this kind of stuff. Why? Because that is what God is like. That is exactly what God is like. Read the greatest story, the great narrative of the Bible is about a world, a world that's lost, a world filled with poverty, material poverty, Social poverty, spiritual poverty. But God did not sit back. God did not sit back and just start twiddling his thumbs and leave us to fend for ourselves. He was generous. He gave us his son. He gave us his son, Jesus. And Jesus gave up everything. He gave up everything dying on a cross. And that one day, the resurrected Christ, the resurrected Jesus will put an end to all poverty. Material poverty, spiritual, social poverty. But he's going to make something new. He's going to make something new. 
But for the time being, he asked us, his people, his church, to trust him. To trust him. When it's, this is the time to be generous. It's not just about giving money. It's giving your energy. It's giving whatever you, God has given you. Success, power, influence, whatever you have. Give it for others. So as we conclude, our big question today was, where do Christians get their moral compass? Where do they get it from? Our passage tells that our moral compass comes from being aware. This conscious awareness of God's coming judgment. That we are accountable to God. We are accountable to God. And when we remember that, that God will hold us accountable for the evil that we've done, for the things that we don't do, it should motivate us to be fair. It should lead us to this different path that God is calling to us to, to do what is right. We also need to remember that God judges us for the good that we do too. That he encourages us. He challenges us to be incredibly generous. All of us are, including myself, I'm, just, I'm including myself here. Sometimes we just want to be stingy with it. But he's asking us to be generous, to use everything that he gave us to do something. Do something with it. Do something about, however, the material poverty, the social poverty, the spiritual poverty. Do something. We're meant to do something with it. And if we do that, we can look forward to God's judgment. I know everyone thinks it's scary. Ah, ah, everyone wants to scream about it. But when you read it fully, God's judgment, when we can look forward to it, it's because that will be the day that God makes everything right. He's going to get rid of evil. He's going to get rid of all the things that we hate. And that, for me, is a reason to look forward to it. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word today. I pray, Father, that for many of us, when we think about judgment, you know, we're scared of it. We don't like thinking about it. But God, that awareness, it actually helps us. Helps us to do what's right. And some of us here today, yeah, we'll say we believe God exists, blah, blah, blah. There's some Christians here that don't live like he exists. Because if God is real, then he can watch us. There's nothing wrong with that. And we'll be accountable to him. Accountable for our choices and what we do. God, help us to realize that the good that we do, that you've given us gifts, God, help us to be generous, help us to be fair. God, we thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.